Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering part one of a two-part series that will be going over assessment and health promotion of the pregnant patient. So um, on this video, we're going to start off with obesity. But before I get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please like this video. You're going to love it. So press that like button now so you don't forget. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. And don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website at nexusnursinginstitute.com. Now, what I have highlighted is important to know, so just pause to read, but I'm only going to go over um, the content that is seen very often on nursing exams, but I don't write your test, so anything can be on there. You need to know everything, but I'm just not going to read everything to you. I'm just going to point out the most important parts, okay? So anyway, overweight and obesity, these are known risk factors for premature death, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and the list goes on. You guys can read the, the rest. Now, in addition, obesity is associated with high cholesterol. I don't know why I didn't underline hertuism, but that's one of them. That's an excess uh, body facial hair where the women will have mustache or beard, okay? Hertuism and complications of pregnancy. Pregnant women who are morbidly obese are at increased risk for, and you guys need to know this, I put a star next to it, hypertension diabetes, gallbladder disease, post-term pregnancy, and musculoskeletal problems. Now, if you guys take a look at this box, it goes over the ideal um, body weight with body mass index. And so you guys need to know this. However, for testing purpose, what I see tend to show up more when you're being asked about this is a deviation from the norm. So you definitely need to know what the normal BMI is. And look at this. 18.5 to 24.9. Once you hit 25, you're overweight. 25 to 29.9, that's overweight. And then once you hit 30, you're obese, okay? So make sure you definitely know these three, the normal, overweight, and obese. Those are the three that if you're questioned about, most likely that's what they're gonna question you about. So make sure you guys know this, the BMI. Let's talk about lack of exercise. One particular exercise that's important for women is Kegel exercise or pelvic muscle exercise. This exercise is used to strengthen the muscles that support the pelvic floor and should be practiced regularly. And I'm about to go over the Kegels in a minute, but um, this has been seen often on both the HESI and the ATI, where if they ask you about the Kegel exercises, they'll either ask about um, the benefits or the steps. So I'm going to go over that in a second, okay? But make sure you know this. Now, look at this. Uh, physical activity and exercise counseling for persons of all ages should be undertaken. Take a look. Special recommendations include 20 to 30 minutes of moderate activity at least three times a week. That's important. That's why I put an NCLEX next to it. It's been seen on NCLEX many, many times. During pregnancy, an ongoing exercise regimen can be continued, but the intensity and duration should uh, be decreased. So once a woman's pregnant, she should still exercise, just the intensity, how hard she exercised, and the length, the amount of time that she exercised, that should be decreased, but she should still be exercising. Now let's take a look at this, Kegel exercises. You see, I put no up here with my three exclamation marks, HESI and CLEX, make sure you know this. So description and rationale, this exercise involves regularly tightening, that's contracting and relaxing the muscles that support the bladder and the urethra. Make sure you guys pause to read, but this is very important. These are specific instructions. One, each contraction should be as intense as possible without contracting the abdomen, thighs, and uh, excuse me, at, without contracting the abdomen, thighs, or the butt. The contraction should be held for at least 10 seconds. The woman may have to start with as little as two seconds per contraction until the muscles get stronger. Three, the woman should rest for 10 seconds or more between the contractions so the muscles have time to recover. And then lastly, the woman should feel the pulling up over three muscle layers so that the contraction reaches the highest level of her pelvis. Make sure you guys take a look at this pause to read.
sexual transmitted infections and HIV uh, prevention. Prevention of STIs and HIV is possible only. Remember I told you when you're reading your studies, you see words such as only, always, never, first, priority, pay attention, okay? So prevention of STIs and HIV is possible only if there is no oral, genital, or rectal exchange of body fluids, or if a person is in a long-term mutually monogamous relationship, relationship with an infected person. So either no bodily fluids are being exchanged, or if they're being exchanged, the person that they're being exchanged with is not infected, and they are not having any sexual relations, and they're, they're not um, exchanging bodily fluids with anyone else, right? Abstinence from sexual in intercourse is encouraged for persons who are being treated for STI or whose partners are being treated. That is something you have to teach them. They're being treated for um, a, an STD or STI. You have to teach them about abstinence and the importance of that. So guys, uh, make sure you guys take a look at this, this entire box. You can pause to read. Let's go over um, intimate intimate partner violence and um, interviews. So take a look. If a male partner is present, he should be asked to leave the room because a woman may not disclose experiences of abuse in his presence, or he may try to answer questions for her to protect himself. And over here, I wrote, you can lie. This is actually one of the very few, it's, it's the only one I can think of right now on top of my head, but um, the only situation where as a nurse, you are encouraged to lie, lie through your teeth, make up whatever excuse you have to make up to get the person away from the sus suspected abuser. And maybe you don't uh, suspect the man of being the abuser, but the woman just may not want to reveal the information in front of that male partner, okay? So you lie through your teeth. And not only do you lie through your teeth, the whatever lie you come up with, say that, you know, we have to take you for a test and no phones are allowed because what happens very often, the abuser will make the woman keep her phone on, on speaker so he can hear everything that's being said, all right? Now, let me stop here for a second, because if you watch um, prior videos, you know I talked to you about closed-ended questions, and there are three situations where you are going to ask closed-ended questions. When you need to do a quick assessment, patients being rushed to the OR, you need to find out if they're allergic to any medications or if they're on blood thinners or if they've had alcohol within the past 24 hours. That's one situation, right? Another situation is suicide. You, you suspect the pa patient suicidal. You ask them directly, are you having any thoughts of harming yourself or anyone else? And the third situation is abuse. If you suspect the woman is being abused or harmed, you ask her directly. But the first thing you got to do is get her away from the person you suspect that is doing the abuse. You want to get her by herself and ask her directly. And you lie if you have to do that. Let's talk about the signs of intimate partner violence. Overuse of health services. So it's like their frequent flyer. They're always coming into the ER with um, unexplained injuries or the injuries that they explain really doesn't make sense. They have vague, nonspecific complaints. They're in chronic pain, depression, anxiety. They miss lots of appointments. Unexplained injuries or bruising. This is a big one. Non-adherence to treatment. Untreated serious injuries. Injuries that don't match the description, that's another big one. They have all of these marks on their face that look like handprints, but they say they fell down the stairs. Intimate partner never leaving the patient's side. That intimate partner actually be becoming on the verge of violence when you try to separate them or them trying to answer all the questions for the patient, not allowing the patient to answer questions for themselves. Intimate partner insisting on telling the story of the injury, okay? These are um, signs to watch out for. Guidelines, communicating with abused women. Make sure you know this. So let's talk about what not to say. Do not ask why. 
When you say why, you're putting them in the position where they have to try to defend themselves or defend their behavior or even try to defend their spouse, okay? You're re-victimizing the patient. Never say why. And you guys know this in nursing. We never say to patients why, and we never say um, what made you do X, Y, Z. Never. Next. Do not talk negatively about the abuser. All you're going to do is make um, the patient come to the defense of the abuser. Now, all of a sudden, it's them two against you and you're trying to help the patient. Do not talk directly to the abuser about your suspicions of abuse. Don't even let them know that you're on to them. Here's what you should say. I'm afraid for your safety and the safety of your children. I believe you. You deserve better than this. You deserve to be treated with respect. You're not alone. This is a crime. I am here for you. You want to offer self. What to do? You want to empower the victim. Let them know that they have resources. One second, guys. Okay. Uh, you want to empower the victim. Let them know that they have uh, resources and avenues. You want to sit down with the patient. When you're sitting down, when you're talking with her, you don't want her sitting down and you're standing up because she's looking up at you, right? You want to be eye level. Assure her of total privacy and confidentially, confidentiality, but only if you can, because there are some things that are absolutely reportable and you're a mandated reporter. Use your best listening skills. Call 911 and report any incident of immediate danger. Look what I wrote on the side. If you have a choice to notify the, notify the supervisor, do that. So for um, testing purposes, you'll get a question, something like, you know, uh, the situation where you suspect abuse, what are you going to do? Notify the supervisor, call hospital security, call 911 or whatever the other choice is. When you given those type of choices, supervisor. And your supervisor most likely is going to call 911. But remember, in nursing guys, it's important that you don't break that chain of command. Okay, you're going to do it, um, call, um, notify the supervisor. Now, if the supervisor, you don't have that choice, then you're going to do the, the authorities 911. Okay, and give the woman the telephone number of the nearest battered women's shelter. And you're going to tell her um, to have it on her, like, to hide it somewhere or hide it on her person and important documentation to hide it somewhere, have um, put away um, a bag with birth certificate, social security, uh, a change of clothes, underwear, and have it at a neighbor's house or somewhere nearby. So, you know, if, when she does decide to leave and she has to get away immediately, she can do so. Okay, so guys, that is it for part one. Like I said, this is, was a short video. Part two, I'm going to go over um, the examination, the actual physical examination of the patient. So for this video, guys, please let me know what you thought about this video. And I actually plan on going more in depth with intimate partner vi um, um, violence and the cycle of abuse, just so you guys can have a further understanding. But anyhow, for this video, let me know what you thought about the video. Please don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website. And again, thank you so much, guys. You guys got me to 100,000 here on YouTube. I'm still on Clyde, cloud nine about it. I'm so grateful. And I thank each and every one of you guys for watching my videos and supporting my channel. Thank you for watching. And you guys will catch me on the next video.